final part of our conversation about the Ukrainian Sixties art, I would like to highlight one particular aspect, perhaps the most known and visible one, the monumental art, or simply the mosaics. But I would like to speak about them not so much from the historical perspective, but rather from a contemporary point of view, namely about the transformations of the architectural landscape in Ukraine between 2013 and 2023, and the destiny of the mosaics created between 60s and 80s in Ukraine that have or haven't survived until the present day. I will focus mainly on the current state of this legacy affected by a number of factors, including the full-scale invasion, being the most brutal one. But my arguments will not be complete without making a brief note about the historical context around these artworks. Kyiv is a home to several mosaic masterpieces created in the 11th and 12th centuries during the Kievan Rus era. The most important one, the St. Sophia Cathedral and its mesmerizing mosaics complex, survived till the present day. Another one, however, the Mihailovsky Cathedral and the whole complex of Mihailovsky Monastery fell victim to a utopian plan that was never completed. In January 1934, the Soviet government decided to move the Ukrainian capital from Kharkiv to Kyiv and to build a new government center in Kyiv. The monastery buildings were all demolished to free the area up to the construction site. But the plan was never realized. The Politburo of Central Committee of the Communist Party of Ukraine made the decision to remove the most important mosaics and frescoes and then demolish the monastery. On 26 of June 1934, under the supervision of Vladimir Frolov of the Leningrad Academy of Arts, works began on the removal of the 12th century Byzantine mosaics. A total area of 45 square meters of original mosaics was transported to Russia and appointed among the State Hermitage Museum, the Tretyakov Gallery and the State Russian Museum, where they are stored till the present day. Speaking about construction plans, in 1955, the Communist Party issued a famous or rather infamous resolution, which was called on elimination of excesses in design and construction. This resolution marked a complete shift in urban planning and construction philosophy for the whole Soviet Union. Bare forms replaced the so-called Stalinist empire. Architecture found itself stripped and sometimes oversimplified from an aesthetical point of view. There were even cases where the original design was reduced and initial details were cut off, which ruined the architect's vision. So one can say that mosaics have become a tool to make the new official architectural style more vivid and spectacular. Mosaic constituted the new visuality of many, many Soviet cities and villages for decades to come. In 1960, the National Union of Artists of Ukraine opened a new department for monumental art. It was designed and led by Stepan Kryachenko, the author of many important monumental ensembles in Ukraine. Kryachenko was a firm believer in the transformative potential of monumental art for public space. His own style, as we can see here in a later work produced in the early 80s, together with his son Roman Kryachenko, was heavily influenced by the Byzantine legacy of Kievan Rus, was famous for. Several generations of artists all around Ukraine were involved in state commissions of monumental art in 60s, 80s. It was the so-called Hutkombinat, or Art Combinate or Art Factory, that commissioned works for public space, exteriors or interiors of different kinds of public buildings, from kindergartens to city councils. Sometimes a big factory or other type of state enterprise with its own big budget could commission a mosaic directly from a selected artist or a brigade. But nevertheless, any new piece had to pass a so-called artistic committee to get an official approval. Female artists left no less significant legacy than their male colleagues. And Alla Horska was in no way the only one in this community. Why are Soviet Ukrainian mosaics so popular today? First of all, because they have found appreciation among the younger generation born shortly before or after the collapse of USSR. Among those for whom the propaganda content of many of them doesn't play any ideological role anymore. 
Mosaics have been naturally incorporated into creative practices and contemporary art, photography, installations, movies, but also fashion and even tattoos. And through this, they acquired a new meaning and gained appreciation of the next generations of scholars and admirers. Several initiatives have contributed tremendously to preserving, researching and promoting Ukrainian Soviet mosaics. And it's a good moment to acknowledge them all. They are mainly run by artists or independent curators and have been operating without, or rather despite, any state support. There are also several artistic projects inspired by the Soviet mosaic legacy in a certain way. It is also important to mention that most of the visual material I'm going to demonstrate here to illustrate my points are based on the archive of photographer Yevgen Nikiforov, who has been meticulously documenting this cultural heritage since 2013. And I deliberately use the word heritage, despite the fact that Soviet objects don't possess this status officially. Over the past 10 years, the photographer visited more than 800 cities and villages all around Ukraine. He discovered and documented around 5,000 monumental art pieces and established the authorship of many forgotten works. Around 20% of the photographed works have been already destroyed under different circumstances or are currently located at the temporary occupied territories. Let us have a look at several important monumental pieces of Ukraine and think together about the crucial role that photography actually played in forming our appreciation of this art today. In 2017, art historian Olga Balashova and I wrote a foreword for a book, and I can still sign up for it without changing a single word. I quote, The gaze of the invested photographer helps viewers to see the works. Sadly, not the mosaics themselves, but merely photocopies, as they were never seen before. Yevhen scraps the images clean of the intrusive ambient visual noise of post-Soviet cities that never quite got over their gung-ho capitalism. He crops out all markings of the later decades, including trees, a C's unit, or new architectural structures that violate the original idea and creates a close-up that offers an intimate view of the artwork. The book I'm referring to here is called Decommunized Ukrainian Soviet Mosaics. It was published by Osnovo Publishing and Dom Publishers. Envisioned in 2015 and published in 2017, the book presents a selected outcome of Nikiforov's work. It has become a bestseller in Ukraine and sold out internationally quickly enough. But most importantly, it was one of those projects that gave a start to a national discussion about the further destiny of the monumental art legacy. It was the moment when mosaics were rediscovered and brought back to a public eye. But the paradox here is that these objects were always there in front of our eyes. In Ukraine, many towns and villages, no matter how small and remote they are, most likely will have a mosaic somewhere around the place one grew up and have seen thousands of times, but never paid actual attention to. A reason for this paradox is that the Soviet Union did not develop public spaces such, lacking the basic freedoms to fill such spaces with meaning. The freedom of assembly, the freedom of protest, the freedom of self-expression. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the newly independent state of Ukraine did gain the necessary freedoms, but also let its urban spaces slide into private hands without the chance of becoming public platforms. To this day, many Ukrainians see little merit in monumental mosaics and let them perish without a second thought. Mosaics become shabby with time, disappear behind ugly billboards, fresh plaster or house wrap, or get struck down if they are not to the new owner's liking. Such household decommunization, as I prefer to call it, was complemented by a political one. After the Revolution of Dignity of 2013-2014, Ukrainian society experienced another rapid change of attitude towards everything Soviet-related. In April 2015, the Ukrainian parliament launched the so-called Decommunization Law on condemning the communist and national socialist totalitarian regimes and prohibiting the propagation of their symbols. This law, together with a lack of public consensus around scenarios for public spaces in Ukrainian cities and towns, made the status of 20th century monumental art even more uncertain. 
Many mosaics were strongly associated with Soviet propaganda and got partly or completely demolished or covered up. Some of those that remained untouched were praised by scholars and contemporary artists as a local version of modernism. However, private artistic initiatives saved many of them from natural decay. Between 2020 and 2022, a team of restorers led by Hooden brothers, both of them are serving in the armed forces of Ukraine right now, supported by volunteering artists, reconstructed two major objects of famous Kyiv monumental artists of the 60th generation, Adar Bachuk and Volodymyr Malnichenko, the interior of Kyiv central bus station and the fountain of the Kyiv Palace of Youth. So there was hope that a new chapter in the history of monumental art was about to be launched. But the full-scale invasion was a factor no one anticipated. The war devastation has changed the country's landscape forever. The war forced us to reconsider many things, politically debated yet culturally meaningful, that might become another target of the Russian army. Inadvantably, it had granted a new meaning to the Soviet cultural legacy Ukraine was uncertain how to deal with before. They say we value what we have lost. I dare to say that among other visionary shifts after the 24th of February 2022, it seems that Ukraine started to demonstrate first signs of readiness to reclaim certain parts of artistic legacy of Soviet times and protect it from the annihilation championed by Russia. The state that awoke the succession of the Soviet imperialistic might. Acknowledging many other unthinkable consequences for Ukraine's land and its people, we shall not forget about another dimension of the war damage, the cultural catastrophe it provokes. Not merely territory and political dominance are being put at stake in this brutal invasion, but the ownership of memory and interpretation of the historical past as well. It is a war for cultural hegemony in the broadest sense. Over the past year and a half, the Russian army robbed museums in the occupied areas and destroyed many heritage-listed objects of various epochs in Ukraine. We don't have a precise calculation of monumental art objects damaged or destroyed in the south and the east of Ukraine that were most heavily affected by the full-scale invasion or remain occupied. According to Nikiforov's calculations, there might be around 300 objects in those cities that have been almost completely ruined. There is not enough information about the destiny of many other pieces. But even this partial statistic sadly illustrates the presumption that a substantial part of 20th century Ukrainian monumental art will not survive this war. Only in Mariupol we have documented proof of serious losses to works by local artists Arnautov, Lel Kuzminkov and Valentin Konstantinov as well as by brigades invited from Kyiv, led by legendary Valery Lamach and Ivan Litovchenko, and the other one led by Alla Horska and Alexei Zaretsky. Architecture and mosaics, as they are immovable parts, cannot be evacuated. They remain open and vulnerable and hardly reconstructable. One can claim that the monumental art produced during the Soviet years cannot be taken into account as an important part of Ukraine's cultural heritage, if only there was such a thing as hierarchy in arts and culture at all. And thus, their obliteration is not an urgent concern. Yet, the war caused erasure of this very part of Ukraine's history, art history in particular, unexpectedly reveals a profound paradox of Russian public rhetorics behind the full-scale invasion. There is a widely spread statement about the current war, which goes like this. Russia fights for the past, while Ukraine fights for the future. Right now, we witness how Russian rhetoric and its actions unrelentingly clash. Soviet propaganda remains a latent core of Russian propaganda up to the present day. At the same time, Russia is destroying the artworks produced as a part of this propaganda in the past. If it follows Russian own logic, it destroys its own past, blanks out the cultural and political legacy it pretends to inherit. In its turn, Ukrainian state institutions and private initiatives fight against destruction and strive to protect the art with all means available, which in many cases are extremely limited. Whatever is targeted by the invader, Soviet heritage included, defenselessness before the threat of violence leads to reconsideration of their symbolic weight for Ukraine. Even if the role of certain objects is not yet defined and digested. One case of state support would be the 
activities of the Ukrainian Institute, a state institution responsible for promoting Ukrainian culture internationally, in close cooperation with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In 2019, the Ukrainian Institute produced a project called Discover Ukraine Bit by Bit, a large media projection created by artist Thais Poda, accompanied by music of Ptah Jung, band and based on Nikiforon's photography archive. The mosaics were digitally animated and projected on the facade of Leopold Museum in Vienna. The annotation to this project on the official website is quite remarkable. Initiating the project, the Ukrainian Institute spreads an impulse to reapproach the heritage of monumental art and preserve it. The Ukrainian Institute and the artists involved in its creation manifest the significance of unique heritage of Ukrainian monumental art and offer an opportunity to see it in a completely new light. End of quote. This project found an unexpected continuation after the start of the full-scale invasion. In September 2022, the reworked animated projection was demonstrated at the facade of the old Royal Naval College, listed in the UNESCO World Heritage, in London, under the title Discover Ukraine, Bits Destroyed, and as a part of the UK-Ukraine Season of Culture program. This time, the message was a bit different, the project called out for protection for this legacy, since more than a quarter of the mosaics demonstrated during the original spectacular media show had been already destroyed or under immediate threat by that moment. This wartime projection was touring around several European cities between 2022 and 2023 and received good local press reviews and professional feedback. Here's another case of state acknowledgement in the recent policy of the city of Lviv. Since 2019, around 80 Soviet mosaics in Lviv have been heritage listed. This list was established by the municipal authorities after the demolition of a big panel at the facade of the supermarket, formerly known as Ocean Fish Shop, with the relevant visual theme. The owner was forced to fully restore the piece under the pressure of the professional community and the artist's son, who claimed the violation of his father's copyright for the mosaic. It is a particularly interesting case since Lviv, unlike Kyiv or say Kharkiv, was much more swift with the communization of its public space right after the USSR collapse. My main conclusion today is quite simple. The bigger construction that awaits Ukraine after the victory in its brutal war is not just the chance to bring back the normality of life with all its basic safeties and comforts of everyday life as we know before. But it's a huge chance to reclaim what we have lost even before the military invasion during the years of more visible and less invisible Russian colonization of Ukrainian culture, as well as, as its major influence of Ukraine's own retrospective look at its history chapters of the Soviet era. It might be a crucial chance to reimagine not only the future we are fighting for right now, but also to reimagine the past, however complicated it was. Perhaps Ukraine was not fighting for it in the first place, but this battle will be won regardless. Thank you.